at the beginning of the 45 BC year, before the new Julian calendar created by Caesar and Sicigenes of Alexandria took effect, Caesar was again absent from Rome. Sometime during the last quarter of 46 BC, which had been extended by 80 days so as to bring the calendar in line with the seasons, Caesar had received word from Hispania that Pompeian legions had once more coalesced under the command of Titus Labienus, allied with Nius and Sextus Pompeius and the former governor of Numidia, Publius Attius Varus, all of whom had fled to Hispania following Caesar's victory at Thapsus. In Hispania, the many legions who had defected to the Caesarian party after Caesar's victories at Ilerda and Massilia were now ripe for defection back to the Pompeians. Titus Labienus capitalized on the anger fomenting within Hispania's legions after the men learned of Caesar's massive payouts to his legions in Italy. With many of the legions now openly declaring for the sons of Pompeius Magnus, Titus Labienus was able to raise even more legions from among Hispania's cities. These local recruits, anxious to protect their homes, found it more prudent to fall in line with the quickly massing numbers of Pompeian legions than to resist in the name of Caesar. In response, Caesar sent two legates, Quintus Fabius Maximus and Quintus Pedius, who was the grandson of one of Caesar's sisters, to deal with the rising Pompeian faction. Unfortunately, Fabius Maximus and Quintus Pedius were not strong enough to attack the colossal army the Pompeians had been able to quickly assemble. With the Pompeians having already laid siege to the capital town of Corduba, Fabius Maximus and Quintus Pedius encamped their forces at the nearby town of Abulco, and sent urgent requests for help to Caesar in Rome. Caesar, who had already paid and discharged several of his legions, gathered his favourite 10th legion, and after combining them with the 5th, 6th, and newly raised 3rd legions, he set out for Hispania in early November. Marching at breakneck speed, Caesar arrived in Abulco less than a month later, where he joined the legions under the command of Fabius Maximus and his grand-nephew, Quintus Pedius. We are told that Caesar sent word from Abulco, ordering the grandson of his other sister, 17-year-old Gaius Octavius, to join him in Hispania, where the young man could begin his military training. By the time Caesar arrived in Hispania, the capital city of Corduba had fallen to the Pompeians, who left it garrisoned under the command of Sextus Pompeius before marching to lay siege to the town of Ulia. Ulia was one of the last holdouts for the Caesarian party, and Caesar was anxious to protect them. Sending six cohorts of soldiers to Ulia with one of his men, Lucius Vibius Pachyicus, Caesar marched the rest of his forces to the town of Corduba, where he hoped to draw the Pompeians away from Ulia by laying siege to Sextus Pompeius. At Ulia, a storm arose at nightfall, which so distracted the Pompeian line that they failed to notice Caesar's legions in the rain and darkness, thus allowing Pachyicus and his men to walk right into the town, where they were able to help reinforce it from within. On his way to Corduba, Caesar's forces clashed with some of the Pompeian cavalry, who immediately notified Sextus Pompeius of Caesar's imminent arrival. Sextus swiftly sent messengers to his brother and Titus Labienus at the town of Ulia, requesting assistance. As Caesar had hoped, Nius Pompeius and Titus Labienus withdrew from Ulia and quickly marched for Corduba, leaving behind a detachment to continue the siege. As Caesar approached Corduba, he discovered that the bridge which traversed the Beatus River had been destroyed by the Pompeian cavalry. By sinking baskets full of rocks and then laying wooden slats across the tops, Caesar built a makeshift bridge, crossed the Beatus River, and then set up camp outside Corduba. Before Caesar could even begin the siege of Corduba, however, Nius Pompeius and Titus Labienus arrived, forcing Caesar to defend his bridge. Multiple battles were fought on the narrow bridge, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. Realizing that he could not force a decisive battle at Corduba with Sextus Pompeius commanding a garrison within the town and Nius Pompeius behind him, Caesar lit all the fires in his camp after dark. With the campfires blazing throughout the night, it was morning before Nius Pompeius and Titus Labienus realized Caesar had snuck out of camp under the cover of darkness. Chasing Caesar's forces to the town of Atagua, Nius Pompeius, Titus Labienus, and Publius Attius Varus, hid behind a heavy fog to obscure their location. 
Marching well around Caesar's camp, the Pompeians meant to catch Caesar off guard by attacking from an unexpected direction. However, when the fog burned off, it became apparent to the Pompeians that Caesar had already claimed and fortified his position on all of the available high ground, and had begun laying siege to the town of Atagua. Erecting their own camp between the towns of Atagua and Ucabi, Labienus, Pompeius, and Varus decided on a tactic stolen straight out of Caesar's playbook. Like Caesar had done at Gergovia, they ordered their legions to seize one of Caesar's smaller camps, under the leadership of a general named Postumius. Caesar responded by sending the 5th, 6th, and 10th legions to defend the camp of Postumius, denying the Pompeians the victory. However, when King Bogod of Mauritania arrived with reinforcements for Caesar, Titus Labienus, Gnaeus Pompeius, and Publius Attius Varus promptly withdrew, abandoning Caesar to winter at Atagua, with plans to interrupt Caesar's incoming supplies and harass his foraging teams. Inside the town of Atagua, a pro-Caesarian faction offered to surrender the town to Caesar if he would assure them of the removal of the Pompeian garrison, and promise not to garrison the town himself. When the Pompeian faction within the town learned of the offer presented to Caesar, they executed the Caesarian sympathizers without orders from Labienus, Pompeius, or Varus. This caused such a dramatic loss of morale within the surrounding towns that, before long, those native recruits who had joined the Pompeian forces to protect their cities began deserting to Caesar's cause. After Atagua surrendered to Caesar, he marched his legions to the Salsum River, where the Pompeians were encamped. The Pompeians, however, ordered an attack on Caesar's forces for which Caesar, busy setting up camp, was unprepared. Although Caesar was eventually able to stabilize his defensive lines, he decided to withdraw, marching instead for the town of Soricaria, where he might cut off Labienus's supply line. Labienus followed, setting up his camp near Caesar's. After another skirmish, which ended in Caesar's favor, more of the local recruits began defecting to Caesar's camp forcing the Pompeians to withdraw to the town of Munda. Less than a mile outside the walls of Munda, Titus Labienus, Gnaeus Pompeius, and Publius Attius Varus fortified their positions on the high ground. When Caesar arrived with the 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 6th, 10th, 21st and 28th legions, as well as cavalry and auxiliary support from King Bogod of Mauritania, he made several attempts to lure the Pompeians from their superior position. When the Pompeians refused to take the bait, Caesar, using the watchword Venus, ordered an uphill charge. For approximately eight hours the two armies clashed in the blood-soaked mud of Munda. The Pompeians who had defected from Caesar fought for their very lives, knowing that a second pardon from Caesar would not be forthcoming. The Caesarians, as the army of Rome's dictator, endured an equally hard-fought battle for their very lives, knowing that should the old republic be restored, they would all be executed. Every inch of ground that was gained or lost came at a cost of the deaths of many men, and after the nearly eight hours of carnage, neither army could claim an advantage. At this point we are told that Caesar jumped from his horse, grabbed his sword and a shield, and ran into the thick of battle. As the sun was beginning to set, Caesar's right flank, inspired by Caesar's willingness to share in their fate, began to make headway against the Pompeian left. As the Pompeians began losing ground on their left flank, Gnaeus Pompeius ordered his right flank to reinforce the left. With the Pompeian right side suddenly open, Caesar's cavalry and King Bogod of Mauritania now had an opening through which to charge the Pompeian forces. Titus Labienus then attempted a maneuver to intercept the oncoming cavalry and auxiliary attack, but the legions, thinking Labienus was retreating, broke ranks, and the Pompeian line fell apart. Although Gnaeus Pompeius managed to escape the rout, fleeing for the town of Cartea, both Publius Attius Varus and Titus Labienus lost their lives on the battlefield. Caesar's one-time political partner, who had used his tribunate to help Caesar expose the corruption of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum as a weapon enabling conservatives to legally murder their political opponents, 
the man who, having reached the office of Praetor, had given up his right to govern a province in order to follow Caesar into Gaul, and the man who, as Caesar's only legal pro Praetor, had helped to subdue and conquer the nation before Caesar began fast-tracking the careers of younger men, the Caesarian general who had changed sides, dedicating the rest of his life to fighting for republican causes, now lay dead. After the battle, Caesar ordered his men to locate the body of Titus Labienus. When he was found, Caesar personally buried him with full Roman honours, outside the town of Munda. Leaving the siege of Munda, which still held out against the Caesarians, under the command of Quintus Fabius Maximus, Caesar marched his forces back to the town of Corduba to deal with Sextus Pompeius. Sextus Pompeius, however, after learning that Caesar was coming, slipped out of the town in the middle of the night, and disappeared. When Caesar arrived, Corduba surrendered. Nius Pompeius, injured in the shoulder and leg while trying to launch to sea from the town of Cartea, was chased back to Hispania's shore by one of Caesar's naval captains, Gaius Didius. After losing his last stand against a Caesarian commander named Lento, Nius Pompeius, who had depended on his men to carry him in a litter, was forced to take shelter in a cave. But his hiding place was betrayed by several Lusitanians, and Nius Pompeius, like his father, Pompeius Magnus, was decapitated, his head displayed on a pole before the town of Hispales, until Caesar ordered his remains buried with all honours. With the final surrender of the town of Munda to Fabius Maximus, and with the Pompeian forces utterly defeated in Hispania, a young 17-year-old man came staggering into Caesar's camp. Prevented by sickness from immediately journeying to Hispania upon receiving Caesar's summons, the young Gaius Octavius, when he finally left Rome, found himself shipwrecked along the coast and forced to make his way to his uncle on foot, through hostile Pompeian territories. Although Gaius Octavius missed all of the fighting in Hispania, Caesar was intrigued by this particular nephew's fortitude and will to survive, and made a decision to get to know him better. On his way back to Rome, Caesar allowed Gaius Octavius to ride in his carriage, where the two talked for hours. According to sources referencing an anonymous bystander, approximately 30,000 Pompeians were slain at Munda, another 20,000 Pompeian sympathizers lost their lives when Corduba surrendered, and a further 14,000 Pompeians were either executed or sold into slavery when Munda capitulated. Of the Battle of Munda, Caesar stated, Many times I have fought for victory, but at Munda, I fought for my life.